for our guests tonight, Andrew Copson and Richard Holloway. Thank you very much. So, Richard. Hello. This is Richard, by the way. I'm Andrew Cops, and this is Richard He's Holloway. the one with the hair. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. And the walking stick. And the walking stick. So, um, everyone here probably, if this is a, a mostly humanist audience, which it probably is, um, agree with you that religion is a human creation. Mm -hmm. And the idea that religion is a human creation made by human beings and books that humans uh, create, rituals that, 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 that human beings make up is, is one of the main themes of your book, I think. But where you might differ, perhaps, from some of the people in the room, is that you seem to think that, by and large, it's a rather fine and useful creation. Is that fair? I think, like everything human, it's a mix. Um, I think it's, uh, we've imagined, created some uh, wonderful ideas, um, and images, uh, as well as some really terrifying nightmares. Um, and I quite like uh, certain aspects of most of the characters in the book. Um, I think that religion being a human construct, therefore has all the, the blemishes and graces um, of the human mind. Um, and I do think that it probably, on balance, does as much good as the opposite. So it's we no may worse disagree about than the that. average. Um, and uh, I've, I've lived in religious communities all my life, and I've been visited by, by grace and acceptance and forgiveness. I've had my big struggles with them. So on the whole, I probably inhabited a reasonably benign end of it. Um, I had a big uh, fallout with it uh, uh, towards the end of my life in ministry um, over some of the kind of hot moral issues of the time. But yeah. Um, I would think of myself probably as, as a Christian humanist, um, <laughs> uh, still able to own both labels uh, and keep them in some kind of unequal marriage. Unequal. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come, up, we'll come on to that, I mm -hmm. think, later on. I'm not going to be provoked into that early on. Okay. In the, <laughs> early on in the mm -hmm. You say there's, there are good and, and, and uh, bad aspects to all of the characters in your book, and I think that's a really lovely way of thinking about this book, actually, mm -hmm. because it is. It, it rattles along, of course, in very fluent prose, but it's also got a, a very attractive cast. All the individuals mm -hmm. are very uh, well presented as as people and as individuals, um, from gurus to Moses to, to Muhammad and so on. Do you have a favorite character? Jesus, I'm afraid. Oh dear, I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I fell out with his father, but I'm still fond of him. <laughs> um, and um, no, I, 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 I like Jesus as a kind of quirky Jewish comedian, stand-up <laughs> uh, prophetic figure who challenged power, both relig particularly religious power. Right. Uh, Jesus' main target was bad religion, and there's always been a lot of bad religion around. Um, I like Lao Che, um, I, li I, I, I like Taoism a bit, I like its, its jokey, anarchic side. I like, I like um, some, a side of the Jains, I like their idea that non-violence, ahimsa, should apply to ideas. Mm. Um, and their parable of the blind men and the elephant. I mean, I, I like the fact that we all see uh, fr from a particular perspective and relatively. And uh, I think one of the things that I find most difficult about religion and in my awkward loyalty to it is the way it tends to insist that its worldview is, is the way things are. Mm. Um, and I, I like that notion of a kind of non-violent approach to complex ideas and listen to them with, with respect, maybe look at the same thing, but don't claim that yours is the only view. Um, I, I, I like little bits of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. I don't buy samsara and I don't want a single other life. I certainly don't want millions. Um, <clears throat> So I didn't, I didn't go in for that. But I liked a, a kind of inclusiveness in there, an right. ability to absorb almost anything that comes in and into their system. But in terms of individuals mm -hmm. rather than religions, it's Jesus who's your favorite. And Fox, I like that. Like, Fox. Yeah, yeah. Part, because he wouldn't doff his hat to the toffs. Um, right. I think you've got and a lot of respect. Because they were the first ones to kick out slavery. I was going to say, you've got a lot of respect for the rebel in a just cause yes. that comes out. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
in, mm. in the book, and Fox is obviously one of the characters mm. who for you fits mm. that bill. Mm. And if you had Jesus here, though, and you wanted to, to tell him of maybe some of the flaws in his character that you might, what would they be? Double we don't know very much about his okay. character. We, uh, all we have are some stories, a lot of them um, heavily edited. But you do get a sense of um, someone who was aware of the way in which political and religious and even legal power flatten the people at the bottom. Um, and his very simple parables, if you read them properly, and they don't have the kind of multi-layered complexity of, of, of Plato. No. Um, but if you read them, they are quite pointed. The parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, the reason that, that parable is about the dangers of good religion, because both the priest and the Levite, it was their religion that stopped them going to the aid of the guy who'd fallen among thieves, because he might have been of a hated race, um, he might have been dead and therefore an object of pollution. And what he's saying is that, that bad religion can stop you doing good things. I mean, Dawkins mm -hmm. said something similar, um, uh, that bad people will do bad things, but it's religion that gets, you, gets good people to do bad things. But what he is complaining about is it, it can stop good people doing good things because oh. it, it's apparently forbidden. And there's been too much of that in our own struggles in my lifetime with stuff like the liberation of women and the liberation of gays, you know, obvious, obvious. In other words, the religious have to get religious permission before doing good things, mm. which is a heartbreaking nonsense, and he nailed it. Jesus, more anti-religious than Richard Dawkins. That's... Uh... Richard likes Jesus. <laughs> okay, so I think Richard, that's Richard, yeah, yeah, in, in one of his blogs, he, 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 likes, he likes Jesus, yeah. I think it's really interesting that you've chosen Jesus. That's not what I was expecting at all. Ah, who were, um, who well, were you expecting? Well, I, I thought to you were going to go, because like you say, we, you, when I ask what the bad things about Jesus are, you rightly say that we don't know enough about yeah, him. Yeah. But you, you obviously think you know enough about him to like the good bits. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you were going to go for someone more from the East, because I think that when you come on to uh, things like religion in China, mm -hmm. whether or not, some of the traditions that you talk about can be called religions um, or not. I think you're, you're, you seem more fond of them than of some of the, the Middle Eastern uh, religions like Christianity. I, I think that's undoubtedly true, and I haven't read the book recently, so I've forgotten. But, <laughs> but, but the thing, what's happened to me in terms of my own uh, religious experience and outlook is that I, I only want stuff that will help me in this life, which is the only life I've got, the only life I want. Um, and one of the most kind of radical departures for me was when walking down a hill in the Pentlands, um, I realized I, didn't, I neither wanted nor expected life after death. And there's a lot of life after death stuff in certain aspects of Christianity. Less of it in Judaism. They, I mean, most of, most of early Jewish religion was about uh, doing it in this life. Um, in fact, in the new Woody Allen movie, the, the, the um, Cafe Society, which I saw at the weekend with my wife, there's a lovely scene at the end when the Jewish gangster brother, um, uh, just before he's executed in prison, converts to Catholicism because he tells um, his family, these guys give you a life after death, we don't do that. So, I mean, <laughs> um, and so I, 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 I like the fact that it's pragmatic and, and this lifely. Many Chinese religions. Yes. Yeah. Um, In fact, although they do have a supernatural add-on, which I think you can ignore. I uh, can certainly. Yeah. You would. Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah. yeah you, I mean, you, the chapter you call it worldly religion. Yeah. When you yeah. when you come to look yeah. at China, and I think that's right. I mean, do you? What, what What are your reflections on the idea that some people would put forward that, to, which is to say that some of the traditions you look at in that chapter, like. Um, at least some of the successes of Confucius, if not Confucius himself, um, Buddhism to, to, to some extent, mm -hmm. that it actually it's almost quite difficult to call those traditions religions yeah. in the yeah. same way that you would call Judaism yeah. and Christianity. Uh, again, it depends how, how wide you stretch um, the definition of religion. I mean, I kind of semi-include you guys at the very mm. last chapter we'll in my definition that, of religion. Yeah. Because if religion is what we humans make of the mystery of our own existence, and how best to lead it, uh, then I, I think they get, it, it kind of comes in. Um, 
but, but I like the religions and, and I like taking bits of them all. I mean, in Buddhism, it's, it's, it's kind of desire that scuppers us. Uh, that's a great insight to have. Um, I, the, the thing I don't buy in, in Buddhism or in the further West Eastern religions is the notion of endless samsara and reincarnation. I find that a dispiriting idea, as did the Buddha. Um, mm. to, to some extent, like and so he wanted to um, kind of microwave the process that got you off the thing into an, that blew out your candle. Um, so I find elements in all of the religious traditions that, that are uh, that great. Yeah. Um, but also little bits, and I see religion as an art form. Um, I think it t it's, it's mistakenly, a lot of it tried to publicize itself as, as a knowledge form, as a science form, but if you, once you, you see that this is a work of the human imagination, it's an art form, you can therefore use even its darker metaphors mm. tell you something. So you use religion that way in your own life. Um, it's the view of religion that you take in the book. It's mm -hmm. the view that has led to some uh, criticism from really people who are believing religious people who take a different uh, view. Do you think that that's a view that's becoming more common today or, or less common? I mean, there are a lot of people who are saying, mm -hmm. uh, and they're on our TV screens quite often, um, that religion is a series of truth claims, a way of understanding, yep. a way of knowing. Yep. And I, th you know... Uh, let me answer, but let me back up first. What I tried to do in writing the book was to, um, to be objective and to allow people to make up their own mind. And I do offer three ways of looking at religious material, the stuff the prophets claim to have seen and heard. Um, I call it uh, true, true belief, critical belief, non-belief. And I think they're all perfectly mm. valid ways of reading things. And I'd, um, I've been accused by one uh, reviewer of actually, it, it, it's a work of skepticism to him where I was trying to keep out and just let the reader make up his or her own mind. Um, but, and I've forgotten the rest of the question of offering you that kind of prelude to it. Well, uh, about, oh, no, I've, I've got it back now about the truth claims that religions make. Let me say something about that. that that's the thing that increasingly upset me that. Um, all religions have made truth claims about something that I think is not um, available to that kind of approach. And what I struggled with towards the end in my own life with it is rather than humans sitting down and saying, this is how we're seeing things at the moment, they foreclose the argument, maybe because of deep insecurities in their own hearts, um, and, and, and say the thing is over, we've now got absolute truth. But in fact, in religious experience, that never happens, which is why religion is such an argumentative thing. I mean, they're constantly falling out with each other. Mm. The Christian church started falling out with each other um, almost as soon as it was formed. The Protestant Reformation fell out with Rome and then continued to, because the thing is intrinsically unknowable. It's intrinsically un, unfixable in that sense. And w w what I would love in religious communities, if they could see it a bit, we're seeing the way we're seeing gender nowadays is, is a non-binary thing. You know, that you're, you're not either one thing or another. There's a continuum and quite a complex one. Um, and it's possible to be in religion, to belong but not to believe, to belong and to believe little bits. And what I would like in them is to have the generosity, maybe to allow that. It's all part of this great adventure of humans trying mm. to figure out how to get by, how to understand life, how to care for one another, and religion can help that if it encourages that kind of passionate skepticism and, and creative approach to these things. So you want to do that? Do you think that's a good way of using the resources that religions have produced, as religions as human creations have produced? You want to be able to put, pick the, the good parts and leave the truth claims to one side. But also, right at the beginning of the book, you say that you think that religion starts, in a sense, with truth claims, because it begins when we try to answer the question, historically this is the case, begins when we try to answer the question, you know, what is out there? Mm -hmm. What is, what is mm -hmm. the case? <clears throat> so can you really hope to separate um, these good you know, resources from, from, from various traditions? But it's just as dynamic and evolving as everything else. I mean, there was a time when um, 
uh, biblical readers thought that the first two chapters of Genesis probably described the way it happened, right. um, and it was a crisis for them when they realized it didn't happen that way. But they can still use the material if you use it as poetry and metaphor. I may be just kind of pegging my way out of the religious thing. You may be the future. There may not be any way in which it's possible to hold on to religion for poetic, creative, um, morally dynamic reasons without actually buying it as, as, as a set of truth claims. Um, and, uh, I, but in, in the experience of actual believers and in the experience of actual priests, it's not actually like that. It's much more troubled and charging and churning. Um, and even Archbishop William Temple had, had a kind of crisis of faith about the virgin birth before he mm. would allow himself to be ordained. Very, very few priests in, for instance, the Church of England of a liberal disposition think that the virgin birth was a physical event. They think it's a metaphorical way of talking about a divine initiative in the life of Jesus. So things do move and they do shift in religion as much as they do in everything else, including science. Yeah. Um, and it's just a question of giving people a sense of security enough to be versatile and to play the kind of jazz of this, to listen and improvise and not to be stuck to the same old tune. And it's a very liberating thing to do it because you're no longer having to defend something that probably secretly in your gut you know isn't true. I hated when I had to, had to be doing that. It's actually very freeing when you say, none of this is obvious, none of it is certain, it's all very strange and wonderful, and great visions and gifts and stories come to us that we can use. Let's, let's use them to enrich the human community and not do the opposite. Um, and religion's done a bit of both. But in context, is religion then any more special than drama, literature, all the other philosophy, all the other resources that different human beings thinking through the problems of being human have, have provided? Um, isn't it all one lot of human-created discourses on these topics? Why separate religion out as being of special value in that endeavor? In one sense, maybe not, but in the other way, it, 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 one of the things it does in its organized form is to try and use all that enriching, challenging material uh, and get people to engage with it on a systematic basis. The reason I, I like going to church um, once a week, I find the sermons difficult, but I do, I, I, I like a time to be serious, a serious house and serious earth it is with Larkin. I like the fact that the, that the building I go to distills a lot of something. Mm. I like to examine my conscience. I like to be quiet for a bit. I like to be lifted out of myself with good music. Um, it's not much more than that. Um, That's but quite it, a lot. <laughs> it is quite a lot, but it's, it's also quite enlarging. Uh, and it, I've struggled with my own humanities, we all have. And, and it's very interesting that a lot of that stuff is getting reinvented by you guys because you miss the fact that when you get rid of all religion, you get rid of a lot of good stuff. When I mean, Alain de Botton wrote his Religion for Atheists for that reason. Mm. Um, and I think that if you can somehow cope with the awkward. It's a bit like going home to your family for Christmas. I mean, you have to do it. Um, and you know that you're going to fall out with your wee drunk Uncle Jimmy um, and, and all sorts of awkward things happen. But, but you have to do it. You know, it, it's kind of where you belong and it enriches you. And you're going to be dead soon anyway, so you don't want to waste what <laughs> time you've got. You are obviously in the book are objecting to when religion is taken as a set of literal truth claims, but you also seem to be objecting, especially towards the end of the book, um, of when religion is taken to be a, a sort of political manifesto for how we should police people's behavior mm. through the law mm. and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Mm. Is that that's fair? I think the, uh, the biggest weakness in religion is revelation for me, the idea that, that these special people, the prophets, um, got a message from God uh, that's kind of plenary and absolute uh, for all time. And there may be elements in most of the great prophetic visions that travel well through time, mm. but the social and cultural context in which they had this stuff also gets carried in the vehicle. Um, and it's, it becomes therefore very difficult for religions when that is challenged um, to get rid of it. Um, they have to find religious reasons for getting rid of it. Yeah. Whereas the thing I love about the Quakers, 
they had a, a, a mention it in the book. They did a simple syllogism about slavery. Slavery is wrong. The Bible justifies slavery. Therefore, the Bible is wrong. And in fact, what that did was to liberate them to the critical historical study of mm. Scripture. Mm. And the struggles I had over the ordination of women, over the gay thing, these lovely good people wanting to do the good thing because they weren't bad people. But this thing that they'd pledged themselves to appeared to forbid it. Um, and these changes have, have increased rapidly in my lifetime. I mean, social change is, on, is in warp speed at the moment. And we, we don't give a lot of people time uh, to get up to speed with it. Mm. Um, and, but I did witness a lot of cruelty. In, there were a lot of people who weren't just troubled that they couldn't find a religious way to affirm the life of gay people. There were others, and the Lambeth Conference was an example of that, where in fact it instilled in them a terrible hatred for gay people. And the Lambeth Conference of 1998 was probably the worst, the most depressing experience of my life, to be gathered with all these bishops at Canterbury and, and to watch one afternoon this great baying of hatred towards gay people. Um, and religion can do that. Um, uh, but, it, but it can also do the opposite. It can undo that. It, it, can make, it can liberate people from all these imprisoning shackles. But it's the idea of revelation that's the killer here. Because if you think that you, that you have got this telegram from God, it makes it very difficult to challenge it. And what I would like to do is, is to relativize all the revelation side of religion and to see it as possibly laden with intuitive gifts, um, about how best to organize the human community, but not to concretize it in such a way that you cannot move away from it. Um, you, you, you can't shift your opinions either if, if it challenges contemporary science or contemporary social mores and all of that. But that's a big ask. Um, and there are little groups in religion that do it. The Quakers do it very well, but they're a very tiny little group, but it's De very often the little groups that manage it. Yeah. And the, the lovely thing about Quakers at the moment is that it's inclusive. You can be an atheist Quaker, you can be a kind of um, a theist Quaker, you can be an agnostic Quaker, because they do believe in the importance of the serious life, the considered life, using the resources of, of these rich streams of tradition to make us more loving towards each other. If you step back there and took an, an honest, well, I'm not saying you're dis being dishonest now, but took, took a sort of a long-term objective view of that, do you think that's sustainable? I mean, the Quakers, for example, um, in, in this country at least, it's slightly different internationally, are a, a small and dwindling uh, yeah, denomination. Yeah, but they punch above their weight. It may all well, be they've got over. a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, who knows? Uh, um, but as I, I quote in the book, religion is an anvil that's worn out many hammers. Mm. Um, and there may well be something in the human spirit um, that actually doesn't want to be totally governed by rationality. I mean, I read the wonderful chapter you sent me of your book, and, and I loved it, but I also felt chilled by it because it was, there was, I didn't detect much of the tragic sense of life, the possibility of the goodness of insanity. I, I think that the poetic imagination is close to the religious imagination, and I like the mess and untidiness of that, the darkness of that. And I wouldn't want humans to be narrowly constrained into purely rational living? No, I think that's absolutely right. And I don't think there's anyone that seriously puts that forward. I, I certainly wasn't trying to in that, in that chapter. Maybe we can discuss that afterwards. Um, it's your book that we're here to discuss uh, today. It's a good um, book, by I the way, but yes, it's much more expensive than mine. Well, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> much more valuable. <laughs> there's, uh, <laughs> yes. There's, mm. there's, I mean, there is obviously, well, we've covered that actually. Well, I think, well, I think we, we should move on from that. I'm sure there'll be questions um, uh, about that as well. But you obviously have uh, affection for um, the religions and the individuals who founded religions who address rather than questions of reason and rationality and, and, and truth, um, questions of how to live, um, often that have a tragic element to them. Um, but you also seem to have a lot of affection for what some sociologists of religion call the primitive religions, which is not a very good word, um, but the religions of Native uh, Americans, for example, um, in what's now the, the USA and, and, and Canada, mm. um, some of the um, earlier animist uh, mm. religions and so mm. on. Is that, is that an accurate reading of this book? And if yeah. so, why do you admire them? 
Well, it's probably a kind of sentimentalism. I mean, I was brought up in cowboy movies, and I suppose uh, the Indians always got a bad press in them anyway. Uh, and I'm very moved by the fact that when Europe discovered America as though it had been lost, um, uh, and, and they brought um, this, this religion with them, it did succeed in stamping out what had its own adaptive beauty. I mean, that the, they were no more perfect than we were. But I'm very moved by the way the Plains Indians, that horse culture for a long time, lived fairly lightly on the earth. Um, their, their idea of the great spirit was somehow integrated between this world and mm. what that other spirit world might have been. Uh, and when I read about the ghost dancing phenomenon, what, one of the bits of religion that moves me most is what's ca called eschatology, apocalyptic religion that things are so bad that whatever the, the supreme being is, um, it will erupt into history and sort out um, the trouble and bring peace and justice to the suffering people. Um, and it, it, it comes from suffering, that kind of vision. Uh, and there's a lot of it still around. Um, you, you get these constant predictions of when the end of the world would be. Um, and towards the end of the 19th century, in uh, a prophet, of the Plains Indians uh, said that if they all started dancing, it was called the ghost dancing movement, mm. if they danced and danced and danced, earth would fall from the heavens and cover the white man, uh, the buffalo would return to the plains, um, and they would be in paradise. And paradise was their old life. It mm. wasn't some um, off earth thing. And I find that kind of thing deeply moving because the way um, broken people have used religion to console themselves and sometimes to, to galvanize themselves to action, but it's never done anything because mm. the ghost movement, they dance themselves to death. Somewhere. Exactly. I mean, that is a very poignant... And you get uh, the same thing in African-American slave religion. Exactly. And those vignettes are very poignant. Mm. Um, and obviously you are uh, concerned with the eschatological side of things. You, you, you said that you thought, thought you maybe have been a bit sentimental in mm. relation to major American religion. Do you think you have, do you think you are guilty of sentimentality yes. in this book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems to me that there is a, a strong, I mean, you've, I assume you've led a, a relatively comfortable life, at least in, in later life, sort of uh, affluence, um, all the conveniences, you've fated Very in Very few fate, parish priests are affluent. Well, mm. um, you're not mm. poor. Mm. Um, and, you know, fated in literary salons and so on and so forth. And they, they, I'm not saying that um, there's a, there's a sentim sentimentalization of poverty necessarily, mm -hmm. but there is, I think, quite a sentimental strain uh, in here, which might... How does it manifest itself? Well, I think, I think, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a grand thing to have a tragic view of human life, mm -hmm. but I think that sometimes you need uh, more pity and a more of a thirst for justice when you're in examining individual tragedies. Mm -hmm. And I think that that doesn't quite come... If you accuse me of coldness in, in what I wrote, then maybe um, I think that something that was missing for me was full empathy with some of the people who, um, who were living through these ah, uh, well, scenes. Maybe okay. that's not correct. If that's what you took, um, I don't think it's what I would feel. No, but, um, no I don't think so, having mm -hmm. talked to you now and before mm -hmm. either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm actually a reasonably, moderately human being, you know, yeah. moderately human being. No, I can see that, being. I yeah, can see yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I bleed, I suffer, I can cry. Um, but, um, don't yeah. do it, don't mm. do it. Mm. Um, having said, having criticised then political religion, at least towards the end of, mm -hmm. of the book quite strongly, um, and uh, the... Uh, rightly criticised the idea that revelation could be a, a manifesto mm -hmm. for uh, life. Um, for stopping things happening. Exactly, for stopping, that's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you do also, though, want to draw on um, the resources within uh, religions for good political ends, for greater justice in this world and so on. Is that uh, fair? I mean, is that compatible with the, with the idea that you, can, uh, you shouldn't use revelation? Uh, to tyrannise over other people, well, but then you, you could use revelation to justify well, justice it, and It peace. would depend how you did it. It would depend what, what, what the discourse was, what the rhetoric was. I mean, I, I don't think it actually helps um, if bishops say you must do this because God tells them, but if, if, you, if you say you must do something about the camp in Calais because it's a scandal um, and an outrage um, to human nature uh, to let these children suffer, um, 
then that can make an impact. And I think most of the people who make these kind of judgments, these expressions of outrage and stuff, do it. They tend to do it on the basis of a common humanity, mm. a challenge to greed and injustice. Um, and it is one of the consistent threads in prophetic religion. Religion tends to get institutionalized and take, taken over and gets politicized in the small p sense within the institution itself. You know, who's going to get this job, who's going to get that? But at its best, it's produced remarkable people who have made significant changes um, in, to these great kind of themes in, in human history. Uh, they may not be very common, but I've knocked around and worked in some difficult places. I've seen some people whose goodness was so pure and unself-regarding that they gave themselves to work with people in the slums for generations. I was in El Salvador in 1990, um, and they took me to the dormitory um, and showed me the blood-stained walls where the Jesuits had been machine-gunned by the death squads because they were protesting against the regime in El Salvador, the American-supported regime. And all over the world, as we speak here tonight, there will be religious people from all sorts of different forms of religion actually just working to alleviate and help other human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does happen in, I think, maybe a more organized way in religious communities than in non-religious communities. Do you think communities. so? Um, well, it's partly because there are probably more of there's them There's infrastructure doing it. there as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, of course, there is interesting data on this, for example, in the UK that shows that, you know, non-religious people are just as likely to do sort of voluntary work and uh, in local communities um, and internationally as, uh, as religious people are. In fact, Christians, I should say, because there are other religions that aren't, oh, sure. where people aren't as likely yeah. to do that sort of mm. um, voluntary or selfless work as, as others. And I've always but I don't want to get into a statistical No, I'm not going. No, I don't think we should. I don't here. think we should trade 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 off against it. Mm. I, I'm just interested that you think there there might be uh, a slight advantage to being religious. No, I'm not even putting that. that. I'm not You're actually not. trying. I'm not trying to trade stuff here. Mm. I'm simply trying to look at the phenomenon of religion and the impact it can have on people. And one of the impact it can have on people, especially if they, if, if they do feel kind of imperatively compelled by the original religious vision to give themselves in service to others. Mm. And a lot of that does good stuff. Some of the people I worked with, a, a friend of mine, uh, Lilius Graham, uh, gave herself to living in the slums of Gorgles. Um, she didn't laud it, she was just there. She was an extraordinary creature. And it was a very simple kind of religion, religious prompting that made her do it. Um, and there are people living and working in very tough situations. People in the Red Cross, the Red Crescent do it as well. There are people who are motivated to live out of themselves towards and for others. And many of them are doing it because they're motivated by something they think is bigger than they are. Mm. Um, and I think anything that, that helps humanity stumble its way into greater peace and justice and mercy, I think, gets my vote. And I don't, I don't think it's appropriate radically to question their, uh, their motivation to say to them, you're doing a wonderful thing by going to the side of the road and, 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 and and tending to that man's um, wounds and taking him to an inn and feeding him. But the reason you're doing it is phony. Um, hmm. nah, no, like but, but you might say, but the reason you're doing it is your empathy, your common humanity, and mm. not, as you might think, mm -hmm. your religious feeling, which actually everyone has, but you're just choosing to interpret, or because yeah. of your upbringing, you interpret it in a particular mm. way. I think that that's, it's possible to say that. It's possible to say that, um, and in fact, many religious, even if you, if, you, if you push, as you, your experience is probably the same, if you push many religious people who are working in these mm -hmm. uh, difficult mm -hmm. circumstances, mm -hmm. they end up giving the same sort of answers that non-religious people working in those mm -hmm. difficult circumstances. So what, what so point are you How can you ignore here? those people? Well, I'm just wondering if, if religion, if it's relevant that some people who do good have a religious motivation. I what's the relevance of that fact? It's relevant, it's to, not the, added value, it's relevant, the relevant to the particular good that they happen to be doing at that moment. And if you aggregated all the good that needs to be done and, and the kind of uh, the multi-motivational dynamic of that, you would find a lot of it religion. And I don't see any point in actually questioning that. Right. If, it's actually, if, if it increases the net surplus of human good on the planet, why the hell fuss about... The, the, the psychological or religious motivation. Yes, well, I agree with that. So mm. obviously we're agreeing. Mm. Maybe there'll be questions on that uh, from the audience. Um, last thing then on the book itself. 
there is, as you've, you've mentioned two or three times, you've alluded to humanism and humanists and uh, humanist organizations. And there is right at the end of the book a chapter that um, doesn't major on humanist organizations, but touches on humanism yeah. and humanist organizations as part of the post-religious um, mm -hmm. aspects mm -hmm. of society today. Um, and you say you're partly a humanist, and we'll come on to that perhaps afterwards. But when I was uh, passing the book around the office and, and, and uh, asking some of our members what they thought about it, some of them thought that it was um, a slightly dismissive view of, of humanism. No, oh, didn't which, mean to be. No, well, I, 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 that's why I'm interested, because mm. um, you do seem to construct humanism as being a, a post-religious phenomenon that tries to fill the gap left in some people's lives by religion, um, with ritual and so on and so forth, rather than something that has always existed um, sure. as, I mean, for, for as long I think as that's religion probably has. Well, what I was attempting to do in that chapter was not so much to put the focus on humanism as on the reason why lots of a certain kind of people are giving up on religion. Right. Um, and it, 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 it's called secular humanism, in that your chapter. Book, yeah. and it, it's, in many ways, I like the influence of the secular spirit and mind has had on religion. It's tamed religion in Europe, um, and I think that where religions exist in secular cultures, it tends to purge them um, of their ability to bully and control and persecute, um, and therefore releases in them the more benign element in, in, okay. their, in their self-understanding and their capacity for work. Um, and I think that what I was doing in that chapter was to say why a lot of particular people um, under, say, 40 um, in British culture had enough with religion simply over the women's and the gay issue. Um, and, um, and I ask a question at the end whether that secular spirit, that mind, will in fact take over completely um, and religion will fade away, and I leave the question open. I suspect it won't. Um, and, and partly in terms of, of British religion, I think English religion has always been a fairly a tepid thing anyway. I think the English are an empirical, pragmatic people. Um, they like big religious services for special occasions <laughs> on the whole, but I don't think they've ever taken them too seriously. Someone once said to me, the great thing about being an Anglican is it didn't interfere with your religion or your politics, and there is a sense <laughs> There is a sense in which a kind of benign, rather low-level religiosity of the English short is actually quite adaptive. It's maybe shifting a little bit mm. at, at the moment. But I like the fact that in Europe, the secular response to the idiocy of the wars of religion after the Reformation tamed and purged a lot of that out of it. And I think that, on the whole, most religion in Britain is pretty benign. Um, and on the balance scales of doing more good than evil, I, I think it probably does more good than evil. And it's hardly worth going after um, uh, for that reason. But I, I don't know where um, the future will take it. The stats are all declining in, in, in England and in Scotland. They're beginning to decline in Ireland. Mm. And again, it's, it's, it's it's partly a revulsion to certain in Ireland, the scandal of, 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 yes, of, of yes, child abuse. Absolutely. I think in, in the rest of Britain, it's just the kind of gradual increase of the, the secular spirit, um, the, purging any need to look outside the mm. world or the universe. That may well win out. Um, I'm an old man, my generation will die out. Um, I suspect that, that my own, my way of being religious will probably die out in the family with me. Um, and I think that's being uh, copied all, all over Britain. Mm. But who knows? I mean, there have been extraordinary reversals and things, and things have come back. Um, but I want my last word to be that on the whole, I think the way the British have handled being religion in the last, say, 100 years has has actually been quite benign. Um, and I suspect that it's a broader spectacle than British humanism and will therefore appeal to 
um, less intelligent people, of whom there are probably more. It takes quite a lot of intelligence to be your kind of humanism, your kind of humanist. Um, and I like the fact that, that religion is expansive enough to have one, a, a few very clever people and a lot of moderately clever people, but it also leaves a lot of room for people who wouldn't describe themselves as either. I can assure you our membership is full of completely unintelligent people who... Uh, <laughs> let's hear from some of them. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Richard, for that. It is, it is a brilliant book, monumental, obviously, in its uh, scope, um, but extremely readable and fluent and highly manageable, so I recommend it to you all. Some of you have already read it, and we'll uh, be asking your questions or making your contributions from that point of view, but some of you will not, and we'll want to know more about what you've heard from Richard this evening. Who would like to make a contribution or ask a question? We'll just have a moment to absorb the full ramification. I can't see, There's actually. One there. Oh, yes, there we go, yes. Now, a microphone will come to you, because for those who are <laughs> unlucky enough not to make it, they'll, they'll watch the video. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I haven't read the book, but I had one question. What do you think of the role religion plays in identity? Because I grew up in a very religious society, and religion was an integral part of these people's identity. And that's why that it was very difficult for them to give up the things about revelation, the role it played in morality, the truth claims, because it was very much ingrained in the whole concept of self, who they were. And if they wanted to give those parts up, they had to leave part of their self and let it go. And it was very hard. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's important. I don't know too much about it, but I know that particularly in the whole debate we're having over radicalization of young Muslims and things, I think the identity question comes in there. Um, and if you're, in a sense, feeling you're a kind of besieged community, um, it does help to distinguish you from uh, something that is unsympathetic that's, that's surrounding you. Um, I like the way um, that the Jewish community, even secular Jews, so th their identity is still related to their total history, including their religion, their, their religious history. Um, I think the identity side of religion is probably pretty faded in Britain as such. Um, uh, I may be wrong about that. Do you think that it's still a, a kind of uh, a way in which people identify themselves in their own selfhood, that, that religion is still a strong component Not, not very intimately, I no, don't think. I mean, no, I think no. it is, I mean, things like the census tell us that a lot of people who don't believe, don't practice, and never mm. think about religion, mm -hmm. nonetheless, if they're asked, you know, they might give an answer like, oh yes, I'm a Christian, they mean, oh, I was christened, or they say, oh yes, I'm Jewish, or I'm Sikh, or uh, what they mean is, well, my family is, not mm -hmm. that. But, but the, the, uh, as a vital ingredient of identity, I think it's 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 on, it's declined quite a lot. I think it right can now. be um, quite an attract. I mean, I I know a number of um, no longer practicing Roman Catholics, um, mm. and if they're atheists, they would describe themselves as Roman Catholic atheists. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a sense in which there's a cultural formation, an entail in there, yes. and there is something in that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that yeah. there's a strong ethnic yeah, element yeah, to yeah. a lot, including. To I a lot did of Robin Christian Cook's religion. funeral. Um, and uh, he was an atheist, but he was a Presbyterian atheist. Mm. Um, and I said that in the funeral. I mean, he, ha he wanted it in St. John's Cathedral because there was something about flinty Scottish Calvinism, which he had repudiated, but there were big strains of it in his makeup, which is why he was such a forensic debater. Yeah. So I think that identity can, can gradually fade um, and it depends, I suppose, on the intensity of the religious community that, that you belong to. Um, Anglican identity, um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, there is one. There, there are many. Uh, there used to be one, yeah, but, but it, it had a kind of liberal inclusiveness mm. a, about it, uh, that you didn't talk about religion much, that was bad form. Um, Do you, you think know, that's declined? I, mean, I, think I think that that's has declined, declined an awful lot. And I think that there's some evidence that, that the Church of England in particular ha has, has become much more religious yeah, absolutely. In, in a sectarian sense. I mean, this is very noticeable in England, especially in relation to schools, state oh, schools, where a lot of people yeah. who will have attended a Church of England school, perhaps as a child themselves mm. in the 60s or 70s mm. or 80s, now find themselves quite shocked by the 
the level of um, re-religionization of the mm. curriculum and mm. of admissions and mm. so on that's going in church mm. in the schools mm. today. And I think that's right. And there are many people, of course, who've written uh, books about this, like Linda Wood. Well, there's, the, yeah, the, yeah, there's yeah, that yeah. book out at the moment, because yeah. that was the church that was. Yeah. But identity, I mean, when you said earlier on that you wanted to be a sort of Christian and a humanist, um, was that a matter of identity then or of belief? It's a matter of experience. It's a matter of, of being happy to live with kind of inconsistency, with, with wanting to affirm. One of my favorite theologians, F.D. Morris, um, said that men are usually right in what they affirm and wrong in what they deny. Um, and th there's, quite, there's a lot to affirm in, in humanism. Um, uh, and I, I like the notion of this worldliness, of actually wanting to use our collective genius and sympathy to make it a better trip for people, um, to make the world, which is a pretty ugly, grim place at the moment and always has mm. been, uh, to counteract that. Um, and I think that there is a strong element of that kind of humanism in Christianity. I think there are probably entails of, of Christianity in your kind of humanism. Um, I don't want to hammer that, but, but I, I do think that you can, you can find patches of light in all sorts of funny wee corners. Sure. Well, I think as, I mean, when you uh, believe, as you and I both do, obviously, that these things are all human uh, mm. ideas and mm. human creations, it's mm. inevitable there's going to mm. be some crossover uh, amongst these ideas. Um, yeah, there's, now, there's, now everyone's, it's, just, it's a classic, <laughs> everyone's now ready. Um, is that Hester halfway up? The, hello, Hester. Let's have, let's have Hester there. And then we'll go back and then forwards again. There's plenty of time. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping that you can both help me today. So I'm a congregational atheist <laughs> um, and understand and like, you know, the things that you're, you're saying, Richard. Um, but I've found humanism a great thing. I'm a celebrant now and a, a member of the BHA um, and proud to say I'm a humanist and think that's a helpful thing as an as a philo everyday philosophy. Um, but the, the pamphlets, the British Humanist Association philosophical um, pamphlets say that humanism starts with non-belief. I have a problem with that. You know, I grew up learning about humanism as a renaissance phenomenon where the humanists were, would have been Christians, um, taking on a, a tradition which started perhaps with the Greeks and Romans or perhaps earlier. And so I think of humanism as a, a global and a... Um, uh, a phenomenon that's probably, you know, started when people started thinking and, mm -hmm. and discussing mm. and, and thinking about all these things and woven in with religion. Um, and that our project today is probably a liberal project that we want to fight for human rights and, and mm -hmm. love and compassion and all of that. And, and in that sense, the difference <laughs> between those of us who don't believe and those of us who believe is neither here nor there because we need to be pragmatic and just get on with it. Um, and yet, belief is a... It's important, it's a big thing. So this is a, con a conundrum, and I wonder if you can both address it. Well, I shall revise our pamphlets, perhaps. But mm. My own... Um, in, in one way, I don't really mind what people believe, as long as it doesn't make them cruel, as if it makes them kinder, even if it's an absurd kind of belief. Um, and the human living is so complex, and the human mind is able to... Uh, hold so many contradictions in mind, and I really don't mind if people believe in even in an Adam and Eve and a physical resurrection and all of those things. I don't think I've got the right to disturb those simply because they're historically inaccurate. If, if they're precious to them, and as a result of that, th it makes them more caring, more open to the needs of others, and more kind. Um, on the other hand, if if you come to me with an absolutely kind of um, rationally perfect religion uh, that, 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 that's beyond any kind of disproof, but it makes you a cold and contemptuous person, I'd rather have the kindness-inducing superstition um, than the kind of the chilly indifference of, 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 of an absolutely rational mind. Now, I'm not saying you get that in humanists, but, but we know enough about human nature to see these very strange mixes in, in humans. 
And, and religion can do direct opposites. It can make some people very hard and chilling, probably because they're not in touch with their own inner doubts. And it can make some people just meltingly open to others. You know, I think the present pope, and I don't want to get into his theology, but there is something in the present pope that has that capacity actually for, for simply wanting to stop the big religious rhetoric, the doctrinal struggles, and affirm simple things like reaching out to others and being human and the cup of cold water and visiting prisoners and all that. And he's surrounded by an immense um, magnetic pull in the other direction. And you do get these odd little flashes in history of remarkable people with, with a kind of simplicity. And I think his simplicity is hard earned because I think he was quite a tough mm. authoritarian nut when, when he was um, the, the head of the Jesuits in Argentina. Mm. And I think it humbled him. Um, and so I, uh, I'm sloppy about all of this. I've already been convicted of sentimentality and admitted to it, because looking around, you see the—I mean, you see the variety of ways in which human beings can find motives for helping other people. Um, and even if they're really extravagantly odd, it doesn't really much matter to me, as long as they don't try to impose them on other people. Um, so all I would say to you is test it by its fruits, you know, hmm. by the kindness, um, uh, by the purging of cruelty and, and judgment. Um, ultimately, that's, that's the kind of distillation of all of the stuff that we want. I don't think I would give an answer very different from, from that, um, perhaps some, some different words, but I think my, my sentiment would be the same. I, I mean, there are people, obviously, and there are people who are you know, convicted humanists, that makes sound like a crime. Um, humanists of deep conviction um, who uh, really care most about the truth, and they're, they're the most, and they find their analog in some religious people. The most important thing to them is that everyone ought to just really ought to realise, you know, because it's so obvious, um, mm. you know, mm. that there is no God and how things are, and, and, and mm. so on and so forth. Um, and I, I, I agree with what Richard has said. I think a far more important test. Um, of your beliefs and your attitudes and uh, your whole world view um, is the uh, impact it has on others and the way it motivates you or doesn't uh, to help people rather than to harm them and to be kind rather than the opposite and to be open-minded rather than the opposite as well. That, that's only a very personal view, of course. Guy at the back and then the woman three rows forward. Thanks. And then I'll come over here. Hello. Um. One of the biggest books of the last couple of years has been Yuval Harari's Sapiens, where he talks about myths. I'm not hearing very well. Is that Rory? So, yes, it yeah, is, Richard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the last, big last books, uh, the, one of the big books of the last couple of years has been Yuval Harari's Sapiens, yes. where he talks about creating myths, that how, how we have expanded and succeeded as humans by creating myths like money, yeah. uh, which... Um, I was just wondering, you know, given there's endless stories of sort of religious discipline sort of driving people onwards, do you think we would have got to where we are now without religion? Huh. It's a kind of funny one to think about, actually, um, because it's kind of, it is kind of hard to think um, religion out of the story because it, the, there seemed certainly early on to be an obviousness about it. Um, and it may well be that we're fairly early on in our own history as human beings if we allow ourselves to survive in, in the planet. Uh, and I, I suspect that, that we could well be in the early days of this kind of thing and that it could be succeeded um, by organized formations that no longer look outside the universe, that think there isn't outside, there is just it. Um, and therefore we are on our own um, and we better get together to sort it. And I think that, that was one of the, the good big discoveries in, in, in the kind of humanistic impulse, um, is that th these are our problems. Mm. We created these things, um, and don't think there is a, a kind of big daddy in the sky that can rescue you, um, because the record of the rescue efforts promoted by that um, entity have, have, have not been very encouraging. And it, 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 but there is something in us, there's a kind of messianic longing in us. If you watch a Trump rally um, and see the faces of those discarded people 
Um, because they have been discarded. I mean, the, the whole kind of the industrial revolution of our time, it's very greedy with poor people. It just discards whole communities. My father was discarded as a tradesman because they, they found another way of printing cloth. And he was an old-fashioned block printer. And he just threw him out. I've seen it happening in community after community in Scotland. And, and, when, and when, when the dispossessed are utterly dispossessed like that, and they're looking for some kind of messianic rescue figure, and you watch them at Trump rallies, sometimes they're crying in ecstasy, sometimes it's an ecstasy of hate. So there is something deeply embedded in the human being about looking for a savior. I mean, it's there in all the religions. I mean, uh, I think a, a lot of it in its present form came from a Syrian religion, but it is deep. It's deep there. It's not in all the religions, is it? No, I mean, no but, but it's, it's so, deep in many of them. Yes, many of them. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't yeah. think it can be true to say it's a completely common human experience. I think we've got to be careful, I'm sure you agree, we've got to be careful uh, not to say this is our experience now and therefore mm. this is human nature and it always has been. I mean, pre-modernity, pre the ancient Greeks were pretty good at carving out a, a moral space mm -hmm. for humanity mm -hmm. on the idea mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. universe was indifferent and we had to find a way. It wasn't a very cheerful necessary, mm -hmm. necessarily life, but we had to find a way um, to, to sort things out as best as we could. And that yeah, that's, was, the, it was and is still the case in most Chinese religion, for example. So I think you can say that mm -hmm. there is another way. Mm -hmm. There always has been another way of looking at it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, we are kind of um, unbalanced in that sense. I mean, mm. the, the, there is that. Um, but it's also quite potent, and it's been very potent in the 20th century. Uh, yeah, of course. Was your question almost a historical one, sort of where would we be if not for um, religions? Yeah, so Why we grew up. Well, well, we've yeah, achieved so yeah, much yeah, at the moment. Yeah. 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 yeah, at the moment. Mm. I, think, I think that the, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about this book, actually, um, is that um, it, it touches on some ways of thinking uh, and traditions that often aren't described as religious, like some of the uh, Chinese traditions, for example, which have had the same sort of civilizing effect and have mm. kick-started the same sort of progress as, as some of the other religions are taken to... Uh, have done. So I think that I in a way that might suggest that to have you know, monotheistic uh, Middle Eastern type originally from the Assyrian model um, religions isn't necessary to have. But the fact is wherever it came from notions of of organized systems of law came into it. I mean, we, 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 we kind of whether it's the kind of Hebraic tradition or whether it's, mm. it, it, it's the kind of Confucian, more That's humanistic. I mean, one of the things that we stumbled our way towards um, was the need to have institutions that to some extent held us in some kind of balance. And then, of course, being human, we unbalance ourselves by giving the institutions too much power. Um, and so you stumble into legalisms. It's almost impossible to get things right for very long in human living and in human history. And I think we just bloody well should get used to it. Uh, there was a yeah, woman just here with the long hair and then thought, and we're going to come back over here then. Are there two microphones or only one? Yeah, yeah. There are two. Well, maybe the second one could come round to the front then to make our way back afterwards, yeah. We've still got plenty of time. Well, I have anyway. Have you got plenty of time? Yeah. I don't know about you, but we've still got plenty My of time. My train's not till tomorrow morning. Oh, well, there you go. We've got all night. Yes. Hello. You said in the discussion that um, you don't like religion when it stops people from doing good. But then later, and much more often, you applaud religion for being benign and helpful. Mm -hmm. And yet, I think that compassion is a natural aspect yep. of human feeling. And that, in fact, religion can only interfere with it. And it's only in a secular societies and where religion religious feeling has grown weaker and weaker and less dogmatic, that you actually uh, see tolerance and kindness being um, exercised, you know, to a greater extent. I mean, would you agree that... <laughs> um, I think it's probably too sweeping a statement. I mean, it clearly is true. Um, almost anything you say about anything you probably immediately ought to balance by saying the opposite. I mean, there is a sense in which um, it has operated that way. It may be, 
that compassion is almost an original endowment of the self, a kind of an intuitive thing. Um, and, and if you're a religious person making truth claims, you may have to offer some kind of divine justification for the feeling that you have anyway. Um, the, the, to go back to the parable of the Good Samaritan, the interesting thing about it, at the heart of it, there's a very explosive Greek verse, uh, Greek verb, um, that, that, that the Samaritan, his guts writhe with pity within him at the sight, and uh, the, the idea being that it obliterated the religious code that would otherwise have stopped him doing. Now that, that's a kind of pure yearning of compassion. You've probably felt that yourself. I've felt it. Um, uh, it, it's that some kind, it just draws out some invasive yearning towards the other person, um, especially if they're, they're in some kind of need. It does seem to be deeply instinctive, and it may be um, that religion has come along and kind of tried to own it and copy it. Um, but also the Samaritan was a despised, he was from a despised uh, group, wasn't he? The Samaritan was, was not... Hearing. She's saying Sorry, that. the yeah. Samaritan was not, um, he was from a despised group of people. He, he wasn't the sort of person who was expected to be kind because he wasn't approved. He didn't have the right religion. Yeah, but he had the same, uh, he, he was simply a heretic. With them. I mean, the, the, most religions, um, they fall out over tiny things and it was, I won't go into the detail of that. But on the whole, they had the same God, the same commandments the same purity issues. And um, the same desire to control human sexual behavior, which seems to be a very strong feature and damaging yep. of religion. Okay, mm. then, let, come on then. I mean, so this is, a, this is, a, this is quite a robust challenge. Mm -hmm. more, 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 more robust than I've uh, mm -hmm. essayed in, in our discussion. Well, so it, human beings, right, born with compassion, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a biological basis to our morality. We build on mm -hmm. it through culture, but nonetheless, it's there in us. How can uh, you know, religious codes that take the source of morality outside of human beings and put it somewhere else do anything other than distort and pervert that sort of na native compassion that we have? They, they may do that, but they may also create good stories that help to encourage it and to ignite it. Um, it depends entirely how the material is used. Certainly, if you make an absolute supernatural claim about it, um, that you can only be compassionate if you're obedient to God, mm. That's a manifest nonsense. Um, but, but surely the point should be to increase compassion and not debate about the, the dynamics of where it comes from. And if, if, if your compassion is increased by uh, separating yourself from religion, uh, or it indeed is increased because you think that following your religion, the example of a particular religious figure, um, strengthens your determination to be a compassionate person. Because the thing about compassion, once you've had the spasm of pity, what are you going to do? Uh, you have to do something. You have to, you have to get them to the hospital. You have to organize um, a trunk load. You have to build a soup kitchen. Uh, and so the compassionate spasm may fade, but what re really then works is agape, is actually hard working, making a difference. Okay. Um, and if you simply do it on the spasm theory, uh, then you might buy a big issue or put something, but, but you might not give yourself to an organization that actually seeks to make a massive organized difference. And you're saying that religions can do that thing quite well. It's they one of the things that religion well. can do. I'm not saying it's, and so it's a reason therefore not to dismiss religious induced compassion because it can get results. And if, and, and if you're wanting to widen the impact, the organized impact of compassion, anything that get more, puts more fuel in the tank is something you should, Except, even if you don't think it's necessary, but if that's the way it works for some of those people. So, it works for some people, not for others, but let's not worry about it having to work for let's everyone. Just if it works it. for some people, yeah. let's do yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. And but that let, seems but to let's be his go, basic answer. But let's go beyond the actual spasm and, and do the doing of it. Um, yeah, we're coming forward and then to this guy here, and then we're coming here, and you will also get your question, don't worry. <clears throat> no one will be denied. <clears throat> Who's next? There you are. Richard, I wanted to ask you a rather more practical question. I empathised with your um, comment about enjoying you know, religious buildings. And I, 15 years ago, when I was living in Worcester, I wrote to the Bishop of Worcester and said, I love coming to the, to the 
cathedral and sitting there and contemplating, uh, but I'm a, a member of the British Humanist Association, can we start a secular Friends of the Cathedral to help with mm -hmm. the upkeep? Mm -hmm. And he liked the idea, but the deacon didn't, so nothing happened. But what, from a practical point of view, as religion declines in this country full of wonderful religious mm -hmm. architecture, mm -hmm. what are we going to do with it? It's, it's a particular problem for the Church of England at the moment. It's got these lovely, wonderful parish churches all over the place. Um, and that very book we were talking about, that was the church that was. It ends with a plea for the whole community to, you know, to mm. move in and cherish these places. And it may be that, that um, they need to somehow persuade the country that they belong to the total experience of the English people. Um, most churches that I know um, are more, most, uh, they're quite hospitable in the way they allow their buildings to be used. Uh, during the Edinburgh International Festivals, there's not a church in the city that's not being used in some form. Every, it's partly because they make money out of it, but it's, it's also um, because they want, in a sense, to address the festival and be part of it. Um, and yeah, I think you put your finger on that, and I don't quite know how you get the, co the conversation going, but I'm deeply moved by Larkin's poem, Church Going, which is precisely about this thing. And at the very end, he wonders what's going to happen to these buildings when there's no one left to do the things in them that they believe in. Um, uh, will, will odd people turn up at night and that kind of thing? So, so we do need um, a kind of thinking that cherishes the residue of systems of belief that may not work for oneself today, but are creations of beauty and have a kind of depth, a distillation of something. The reason I like old, really old church buildings is they've been sorrowed in, they've been rejoiced in. Um, uh, people have, have gone, uh, uh, gone into death from them. I mean, the, there is a sense that the building I love in Edinburgh trapped a lot, a lot of that. It, it, it withholds something and yet it delivers a sense of sorrow, a sense of of the awfulness of what the years have done to a lot of people. And great buildings do that. Um, and if we could somehow develop an ecumenism of the sacred that didn't try to attach it necessarily to some kind of supernatural agent, but allowed that, if that was the way um, people wanted to think about it, don't we need a, a kind of, just a greater generosity of the ways of being human, especially if we can purge ourselves of all the ways that narrow and confine and make us cruel? And I think we've got a good, we're in a good pl place in Britain to do that at the moment. Um, the Church of England has made it quite difficult um, recently for humanist groups and even some yoga groups because they see on, you as competition. In, yeah, yeah. To, 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 to have. I mean, even my own grandmother, um, who died earlier this year, um, she wanted to have her funeral uh, in uh, the local church hall because it was mm. the only place where the staff from the care home could, mm -hmm. could, could mm. come to um, that was nearby and we thought, well, it's a community asset. Um, but the moment that he heard that it was a humanist funeral, the, the priest who was in charge of the church said, no, absolutely not, and we had to go off to the, somewhere else where the staff couldn't come. And I think there's a lot of stories like that. And at the yeah. same time, the Church of England is also mm. selling them off as bars and restaurants mm. and making money I by getting these things mm. off, the, mm. off, the, off the balance sheet and so on. So I think there's a long way to go mm. before the Church a lot of England... Of priests do get into very idea. narrow and defensive, especially if they've got a very uh, tightly defensive kind of theological yeah. position. I mean, the very fact that some evangelical clergy won't allow yoga in their halls yes, exactly. in case there's, I mean, there is a non... But you do, you do get, get the opposite as well. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah... There is a humanist, uh, humanist member of the House of Lords who uh, is, is constantly uh, asking questions of the government and thinking about bringing forward a private member's bill to sort of compulsorily purchase all these uh, village churches and so on, or slap sort of orders on me and they have to mm -hmm. be used for community mm -hmm. use. And mm -hmm. I think that's quite a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, yes, over here. And we're going to move our way back over this half of the, of the room and then we'll be done. Thank you. I haven't read the book, so sorry if you've already addressed it in there, but I wanted to hear some of your thoughts on the impact of transnational movement and communication on religion and identity. On the one hand, as noted earlier, feelings of alienation from being an ethnic minority in a country can lead to an entrenchment of yeah. that religious identity. But on the other hand, 
the very act of being exposed to other world views or living in a society in which other world views are more tolerated can itself provide a means of escape from those more traditional religious identities. Thank you. Is that the question? Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, and I think that if we can be patient and give each other time, a lot of this will settle. I mean, I think that there's no doubt. I think that um, um, the Muslim community in the Balkans was probably as secular mm. as, as the rest of the community. Um, I think that, that, that the complexity of our situation, it, it, certainly about Islam, is that we've mucked about in the Middle East so much in the last umpteen years that, 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 that we've created a counter dynamic to that secularizing, modernizing process that turns religion um, more benign than it does when it's in an ascendant position. And I think that when religion is in control, it, it can't resist a kind of form of transcendental bullying. But when it's, it's permitted in a multicultural society to exist on the whole, it does it in a fairly benign way. Uh, you can have all these, these truth debates. Um, and I suspect that if we survive, if these, if these processes continue, um, then that might happen more rapidly. On the other hand, it might be so disturbing to some communities that they dig in and, uh, and resist it. But I think that with patience, it will, it will happen. Um, uh, what the future will hold in an increasingly kind of digitized world, um, I don't know. New religious formations may come. It mm. may be um, th that guy has written this, this new book, Homo Deus, um, mm. about, 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 about the, the impact technology has. Mm. Technology changes consciousness. Um, uh, it's a very alien world for no man like me to be living in. I mean, I'm no longer a native in technological society. My grandchildren have to show me how to send an email, that, that kind of thing. And I will never be at home in it. Um, and I, I suspect that as, as that kind of homelessness increases, it could, it, it could inject other dynamics into the situation. And we know enough about human history to be prepared for surprises. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm interested that you, know, you seem to focus in talking about what's of value in religion on those things that it shares with humanism. Mm -hmm. And I can very much sort of see the, you know, the value of that in, in, in this situation. But does this amount to you actually saying that you don't think that there's anything really distinctively of value about religion? I mean, you talked about the ecumenism of, of the sacred that may be you know, there is something uh, somehow that uh, is, is to do with spirituality that, that is pivotal. And, and, and I find this interesting in terms of your background and, you know, having been a, you know, a bishop for so long. Surely you'll look back and, and think for all the changes in your life that still there is something really distinctive and precious about the religious life, whether it's, you know, we might be thinking about Sufism or, you know, whatever it might be, or, uh, you, you know, monasticism or, or something of that kind? Um, it's very difficult for me to separate my own um, autobiographical experience from the theory of all of this. Um, I first encountered religion as a wee boy in a very um, Anglo-Catholic mystical form. Um, and to me, it was a romance, um, a search for the other, um, a search for the given away life. Um, it, I, I knew very little about official church teaching. Um, and that's what, in a sense, enraptured me. Um, the, 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 People with a romantic temperament are looking for something that may not exist. It's disappearing around the corner. Um, there is a sense in which they're on a kind of a quest for something. Um, whether it's something ultimately transcendent or whether it's just a set of acknowledged experiences in this life, they never quite attain it. Um, uh, and I think a lot of religion is motivated um, by the sense that there may well be something through there, beyond. You get touches of it in R.S. Thomas's 
poetry, which is very close to atheism, but not quite. He never finds the hair on the hillside, but he finds the warm patch where the hair was, um, and it haunts him. Um, and I've always had a strong sense of the presence of the absence of God, um, or the absence of a presence, but it's never been an absolute negation. It's never been a, I'm not an atheist in that sense who absolutely knows there is nothing beyond this. I don't know that. Um, I don't actually think it's knowable. Um, uh, and and I, so I, I've been constantly tantalized by the sense um, of latency that life has given me, that I find on the hills, that there's, there could be something through there. What is it? What does it prompt me to do? Um, and I think that religion um, feeds into that in certain kinds of people, certain kinds of temperament. Um, and, it's, and it's not actually um, subject to rational um, uh, demolition because it's never held on entirely rational reasons. That's one reason why uh, purely rationalist, knowledge-based people are baffled by certain ways of being religious, um, because it's a little bit like the irrationality of actually falling in love and having a particular kind of experience that is beyond the person's description of the beloved is not actually what you think um, she, she, she's cracked up to be. I have been unable to um, slough off that particular skin. Um, uh, it, it, it's not mystical, but there are little touches of it, um, and I refuse to believe that any human can actually figure out the nature of this extraordinary experiment called um, uh, the universe. Uh, uh, 14 billion years into its existence, we are sitting here tonight, and in us it's thinking. I find that actually quite mind-blowing. Uh, that we come along and we start asking these ultimately unanswerable questions and falling out with each other over them. So I suppose what I'm actually, where I find myself, and I'm not making a theory of it, I don't preach it, I've, I've reached that stage in life when I'm not actually interested in persuading someone to see the way, thing, the way I see things, I simply have to tell them my experience of being alive is that certain aspects have touched me with the possibility of anotherness that may not exist, but haunts certain kinds of human psyche, um, and that it's occasionally uh, touched with the idea of an absolute unconditional but wounded goodness that therefore should put us in touch with our own compassion. It's very waffly. Um, it's not, you can't geometrize it. You can't do a logarithm of it but it relates to the experience of countless million human beings, which is why people who don't get it will never get it. Um, and if they try to apply a, a purely rational paradigm to them, they'll be utterly baffled by it. Um, uh, that's really, it, it's, it's, it's nothing, it's, it's almost um, a confession of inadequacy. Um, and there are still places that touch that in me, Bits of it almost got destroyed by my experience of the church um, because uh, it wasn't always a romantic quest after the beautiful unknown. Um, it became a package deal that told you the exact dimensions of the beautiful unknown and the people that had a different set of dimensions had to be attacked. That became increasingly uh, painful to me and especially when it, it hit other human beings. Um, but please don't try and box us all in onto the same kind of um, a Procrustean bed because um, uh, the world, as Louis McNeese, the poet, said, is incorrigibly plural and human experience is as well. And I just want to, uh, to uh, have to say one hurrah to the religious part of the totalizing aspect of that weirdness of being human. Do you think that that feeling or that experience then is is something that is religious or is, is captured by the word religion? I mean, if that's your answer to the question, is there a positive thing? It's human. That is only it's human. Well, I and, agree with you. Yeah, and and what and and I know that, that, that these um, example these these kind of experiences of of the sublime of other. I've read mm. it in humanistic literature yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, you, you get touches of that kind of mysticism in Dawkins. Um, um, very much so yeah, when he's yeah, talking yeah, about science yeah. and, but, and, and the natural what, world. What religion tends to do, and what humans tend to do anyway, they organize. You guys have organized as well. I mean, uh, we, we tend to organize this stuff 
we do it into political parties or into religious parties. There is something about us that can't live with the uncertainty and untidiness of it and wants to get it in a bottle um, and put a stopper on it uh, and then start trading it. Uh, but in actual human experience, it's not always like that. Um, and it's why I shall die um, uh, a religious man, not comforted by the rights of religion, but, but being glad that I was part of something that did enrich and enlarge and forgive me. Okay, we will now have the three last questions, which will come uh, from this guy with the blue shirt, and then the woman behind him, and then the man at the back with the beard. So, and over here. Okay, yeah, this guy with the blue shirt, and then the woman behind him. And if the other microphone could come up to the second seat back from the front here. Uh, Thank you. You've given me my cue for my question. Uh, you are obviously closer to death now than you used to be. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's... <laughs> any minute, I'm waiting for the last bus, which is the title of my next book, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking more about now than you used to? Um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking more about um, the people I love and the cherishing of them. Um, I'm thinking quite a lot about death and dying, but not in any morbid way. I, as far as I know, it's not going to cream up on, on me any time, obviously soon. Um, um, I'm thinking more generously about different ways of understanding uh, the mystery of our, of our human experience, which is why even though experiences like this are a bit uncomfortable for me, I want to experience that discomfort because I hate the fact that we box ourselves off in silos, we human beings, and shout at each other from the kind of ramparts. And I, I find that an increasingly, uh, well, it's it dangerous apart from anything else, um, but, it, but it shows a lack of hospitality towards other ways of understanding the mystery of the universe that, that, that we're in. I, I read lots of poetry, particularly sad poetry, that captures the wistfulness of the experience of being human, getting very much towards the end of it and looking back at the roads not taken, the, mistaken, the mistakes made, but ultimately with a colossal sense of gratitude for it. I'm glad I got, the I got, glad I got a shot at living. Hmm. Yeah, the woman just behind you, if you could pass it back. All right, okay. About 50 years ago... Um, could you I, use it so that I'm we sorry, get on the recording? About, about 50 years ago, um, as a very young woman, um, and having been a curious teenager who, who, of, who, you know, who did the normal things and questioned um, the church that, I had my, that my grandmother used to attend, I read a book called Humanism, and there probably have been many more since then, but then that book didn't mention the word love. Mm -hmm. And so I started to um, look again at Christianity, and I read the work of John Robinson, mm -hmm. and that was published in 1962, and he said then that he thought it would take at least 50 years for the language, in, for the churches to accept the idea that they didn't have to present a supernaturalist, interventionist God to the general public. Mm -hmm. But every time I still occasionally go to church, I feel incredibly guilty because I go along, having, read, having agreed with John Robertson, my mm -hmm. concept of God is as a kind of metaphor for all that we hold most mm -hmm. dear, mm -hmm. what Tillich called the ground of our being. And I don't say that when I go to church because I feel I'm going to be chucked out because every single church still uses the God language. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is very sad because it, it excludes a lot of people who might um, otherwise be interested in certain aspects of religion in the, in the, the stories, the metaphors, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm. And I just wonder what your view is about the continued use of the God language in yeah. churches. Well, Thank of course, you. a lot of them um, uh, believe um, in the content of the God language. I mean, I get quite a lot of it wh where I go to church as well, and, uh, and uh, I'm quite nimble at taking from it what nourishes and ignoring what doesn't. Sometimes it comes in more irritating forms than others. Or find um, or go to churches that don't do sermons. Go to Evensong. Go to Choral Evensong. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is quite... It is, it is, yeah, 
It is quite difficult, actually, this. Um, uh, and and to, to be honest, lot, probably uh, most religious practitioners in the Church of England do, in a sense, believe in that divine ultimate reality. And so they're using that language. It's partly family language. If you got them in the study, you would find a more expansive way of dealing with it. Um, it may be that the sermon as a form is, is over. Um, uh, it's, it's very rarely well done anyway, anywhere. Um, and it can, it, it can become a kind of party political. I, I feel exactly when I listen to most sermons the way I feel when I'm listening to party political broadcasts <laughs> or interviews with politicians in Newsnight, that I'm getting a line because it, it's, it's the official line. Now, I, it, it may be that that will gradually decline. It may be that what these people who believe more than I do, they're keeping the institution alive so that it can continue to carry some of these stories, um, whereas people like me might not be convincing enough to keep the institution alive. So, so it's a very weird kind of spiritual ecology. Last two questions then. The yeah. guy here and the woman up here, and then... Yes, thank you. Um, a very common modern outlook is it might be called atheistic materialism. The traditional atheism coupled with the materialism, that there is the only material world, that, that, that there is really just the physics of our life to explain everything. Might I get your views on whether this atheistic materialism is itself a belief system which fails to answer as much as any religious system the, the, uh, the, the mysteries of existence? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have we got a microphone up here as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to take we'll, ta one? we'll take them both now, I think, yeah, just yeah, because yeah. of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so a small question, because you identified yourself at the beginning as a Christian humanist, and I think the conversation about whether they're compatible and how, what's the definition of being religious is very interesting. So do you perhaps think it's worth drawing the line between those who believe in the human nature or that, that religion is a human creation and those who think it's divine rather than people being religious or not, and then everyone has a different definition of what being religious is? Because some, some will see it as like a, as an ethnic identity, as a cultural identity, and, it's, um, mm -hmm. and it becomes a very confusing debate to have. To have. Mm -hmm. okay, the, the first thing about um, atheist materialism, I think a lot of um, non-religious, non-theistic worldviews come close to um, a religious worldview in the sense that, that it's very difficult absolutely to falsify or verify some of the claims they make. Certainly a lot of, some of those communities have a lot of the fervor that, that, that white hot religious communities do have. So I think there are continuities there. Um, and I think that, that we're all, I mean, John Gray is quite interesting on, on, on this, the philosopher who's, who's mm. a, an atheist, but doesn't like the new atheism. Yes. Um, because he thinks, in fact, it's simply reacting to um, a worldview that he thinks is over. Mm. Um, and uh, th that's the position he, he takes in Straw Dogs and, and, uh, and in a lot of his, mm. a lot of his books, that, that you're, you're simply engaging with an archaic way of understanding mm. life. And so you, you actually you fall into the religious disputatious trap for that reason. And it may be that that's the same point that you're making um, here, uh, that in my, I think what I'm, if I'm trying to say any one thing tonight is I, I've reached that stage in my life when I, I don't believe in and I'm no longer interested in anyone's official truth because I think official truth inevitably is a lie at some stage because the emphasis is always on the official. I'm very, very interested in people who say to me, this is how I'm seeing things at the moment, but I'm going to hold it lightly because I know that from my own experience, I may discard these views in 15 years' time. Um, and it, it's, it's a kind of more tentative, more adaptive way of living that I call existential jazz, just kind of, you know, um, playing some of the melodies that, that, that have become precious to you, listening to what you're hearing because you may adapt and go in a completely different direction. And I think that the old forms of religious discourse, whether they're supernatural or whether they're very secular human, I think in some sense have got stuck in a trope of, of challenge rather than listening, of speaking and pronouncing 
rather than being silent in wonder and picking up stuff and responding. Um, and it may be that that's because religion does that to people. It tends to make them bad listeners uh, and very proud speakers. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of bored with it now, uh, and I'm bored with it when I, uh, I've debated with Richard Dawkins several times. Now, he and I have usually ended up in, in quite a bit of sympathy with him. But the thing in him that is familiar to me is the evangelical zeal bit. Um, and your own hero, Bertrand Russell, said, zeal is always a bad mark for a cause. No one is zealous over the two times table. They're only zealous over things they're not really sure about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, you've anticipated my uh, asking you to show your appreciation to Richard, but uh, don't you think you should also buy his book? I think you should. And it's uh, available uh, at the back uh, there. Um, if you haven't already got it, if you have, buy one for your uh, friends and family. Uh, there are plenty of copies to go around. Thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry we ran uh, four or five minutes over. Perhaps you will join me again in, in showing your final thanks to uh, Richard. And thank you. How do we get there? Yes, yes. And, and Richard will be signing books at the back of the, of the hall there as well. There's the way down there. Okay. Thank you for that.